Now I further saw that between them and the gate was a river, but there was no bridge to pass over it, and the river was very deep. At the sight of this river the pilgrims were bewildered, but the men said to them, You must go through the river, or you cannot enter in at the gate. The pilgrims then began to inquire if there was any other way to the gate, to which the men answered, Yes, but only two since the foundation of the world have been permitted to tread that path, namely Enoch and Elijah, nor shall any others go that way until the last trumpet shall sound. The pilgrims then, especially Christian, began to lose heart. They looked this way and that, but they could find no way by which they might escape the river. Then they asked the men if the waters were all the same depth. No, they replied, you shall find it deeper or shallower, just as you believe in the king of the city. The pilgrims then approached the water. Upon entering it, Christian began to sink. Crying out to his good friend, hopeful, he shouted, I'm sinking in deep waters. The billows are rolling over my head. All his waves are washing over me. Then hopeful replied, Take courage, my brother. I feel the bottom, and it's firm. Christian then cried out, Ah, oh, my friend, the sorrows of death have come past me about. I shall not see the land which flows with milk and honey. With that a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian, so that he could not see ahead of him. He also, in great measure, lost his senses, so that he could neither remember nor talk coherently of any of those sweet refreshments which he had met with along the way of his pilgrimage. But all the words that he spoke still tended to manifest his horror of mind and heart fears that he would die in that river and never obtain entrance at the gate. Here also, as those two men who stood by perceived, Christian was much in troublesome thoughts concerning the sins that he had committed, both before and since he began to be a pilgrim. It was also observed by his words that he was troubled with apparitions of hobgoblins and evil spirits. Hopeful, therefore, laboured hard to keep his brother's head above water. Yes, sometimes Christian almost drowned, but then in a short time he would surface again half dead. Hopeful would also endeavour to encourage him, saying, "'Brother, I see the gate!' and the men standing ready to receive us. But Christian would answer, It's you, it's you they're waiting for. You've been hopeful ever since I first knew you. And so have you, responded Hopeful. Ah, brother, cried Christian, surely if I were right with him, then he'd now arise to help me. Because of my sins he's brought me into the snare and has left me. Hopeful reminded him, my brother, you have quite forgotten the text where it said of the wicked, they have no struggles in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. These troubles and distresses that you are going through in these waters are no indication that God has forsaken you. Rather, they are only meant to test you as to whether you will call to mind what you have hitherto received of his goodness and live upon them in your present distresses. Then I saw in my dream that Christian was in deep thought for a while. Hopeful then added this word, Take courage! Jesus Christ makes you whole. With that, Christian cried out with a loud voice, Oh, I see him again, and he tells me, when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. Then they both took courage. After that, the enemy was as still as a stone and could no longer hinder them. Christian therefore felt firm ground to stand upon and found that the rest of the river was but shallow. Thus, they both crossed over 
the river. I'm going to finish uh, the study up next week with the story of ignorance because after Christian and Hopeful crossed the river of death, then the story is told of ignorance attempting to enter into the gate. But as I had announced last week, I'm putting together a study, a historical study to finish out the spring. We are not here April 1st on revivals at the end of the 18th and the beginning of the 19th century, but I'm also going to discuss a revival of 1857 and 1858 that started in New York City and spread in 1858 and 1859 to the United Kingdom, including Wales. And while I was preparing this week, I came across this Story which I want to read to whet your appetite for what we will be discussing. Discussing in the Welsh revival of 1859, a prayer meeting in a meadow was attended by 18,000 people. They called it the most remarkable ever held in South Wales. Some led in prayer, then they had two minutes of silent prayer. With bowed heads and streaming eyes, the thousands responded. And the solemn and intense silence of those moments was as full of eloquence as any episode. A few minutes later, Thomas John walked in a field nearby, lost in reverie. A friend stopped him and said, What a glorious sight that was when the thousands were engaged in silent prayer. Did you ever see anything like it, Mr. John? He answered solemnly, I didn't see one of them. I saw no one but God. I'm going home, he said suddenly. How terrible is this place? It is too terrible for me. My flesh is too weak to bear this weight of glory. Remember, as we discussed before, the words awful and terrible mean meant different things back then. That meant to evoke Terror and the word awful meant full of awe. But it's just remarkable to me that some people think that this whole thing was just human enthusiasm, that that didn't really happen. And there's a number of stories I'll tell when we get into it that are, are like things you probably have never heard before. But to return to Pilgrim's Progress, So I saw in my dream that they went on together until they came in sight of the gate. Between them and the gate was a river, but there was no bridge crossing over it, and the river was very deep. The sight of this river greatly stunned the pilgrims, but the men who walked with them said, You must go through the river, or you cannot come at the gate. The pilgrims began to inquire, Isn't there another way to the gate? The two shining ones answered, yes, but no one has been permitted to use it except for two. Only Enoch and Elijah have trod that path since the foundation of the world. It shall not be used again until the last trumpet sounds. A helpless feeling washed over the two pilgrims, especially Christian. They looked this way and that, but no alternative way could be found that would allow them to avoid the river. Then the pilgrims asked, is the water all the same depth? The shining one said, no. They could offer no further help or guidance except to say, you shall find it, the river, deeper or shallower, as you believe in the king of this place. From cottage lectures, this Christian and hopeful with their celestial guides urged their way to the gate of the city. Lo, between them and the gate was a river. There was no bridge to go over, and the stream was very deep. At the first sight of the river, both the pilgrims gave a start. The joyful pace at which they were proceeding was relaxed, and a form of their visage, faces, was altered. They were assured, however, that they must go through, or else they could never come at the gate. Then did they wishfully inquire if there were any other possible way of getting to the gate without having to cross that dreadful stream. To this inquiry, they were told the way indeed there was, 
But it was so private and special that from the foundation of the world of all the countless hosts of pilgrims that have passed from this world of sin to the celestial city, only two pilgrims, Enoch and Elijah, had been exempted from the common passage. The king himself had crossed a river, and by his sovereign appointment it was ordained that until the last trumpet shall proclaim the day of doom, there shall be no other mode of approach into the happy land. Our poor pilgrims, as they pondered this in their minds and listened to the murmur and marked the appearance of the river, began to despond and to feel faint and uneasy. If you know the story, it was very difficult for Christian to get over. And I remember reading this for the first time in Archibald Alexander's Thoughts on Religious Experience. It's interesting that on a book on religious experience, this author spent about one-fifth of the book on the deathbed of the believer preparing for death, stories of deathbeds and so on. But he says, in view of the absolute and undoubted certainty of our departure out of life, it seems very strange that we should be so unconcerned. If even one of a million escaped death, this might afford, afford some shadow of a reason for our carelessness. But we know that it is appointed unto men once to die. Hebrews 9 verse 27. In this warfare there is no discharge, and yet most men live as if they were immortal. I remember the foolish thought which entered my childish mind when my mother informed me that we must all die. I entertained a hope that before my time came, some great change would take place. I knew not how, by which I would escape this dreaded event. Death in itself considered is a most formidable evil and can be desirable to none. The fear of death is not altogether the consequence of sin. The thing is abhorrent to the constitution of man. Death was held up in terror to our first parents when innocent to prevent their transgression. And having entered the world by their sin in whom we all sin, this event has been ever since a terror to mortals. The king of terrors. Man instinctively cleaves to life, so does every sentient being. End quote. So a helpless feeling came over to two pilgrims, especially Christian. They looked this way and that, but no alternative way could be found that would allow them to avoid the river. Then the pilgrims asked, is the water all the same depth? The shining ones said no. They could offer no further help or guidance except to say you shall find it deeper or shallower as you believe in the king of the place. With this, the pilgrims resigned themselves to face the water. Upon entering, Christian began to sink and cried out to his good friend, hopeful, I sink in the deep water. The billows go over my head, all his waves go over me. Then Hopeful said, Be courageous, my brother. I feel the bottom, and it is firm. Again, quoting Archibald Alexander in his letters to the aged, Though much indebted to John Bunyan, one of the most fertile geniuses the world ever produced, I cannot easily forgive him for making the passage over Jordan to Canaan so very difficult for Christian. If he had carried out the allegory, he would have turned the swelling waves backward and have shown a dry path across the stream. For no sooner had the priests who carried the Ark of the Testimony dipped their feet in the brim of the river, than all the Israelites passed over on dry ground. But after all, perhaps the honest tinker drew his picture from the fact. For as Christians seldom enjoy in life the comfort provided for them, so it is analogous that in death they should lack that comfort to which in Christ they are entitled. So that's the dilemma. Why did John Bunyan make it so difficult for Christian to pass over this river? And I think about it, and knowing what I know of my own introspection and tendency to melancholy, and how absolute that is. As a tree falls, so it shall lie. I could, I could see that there could be some anxiety and even fear in approaching death. And a few months ago, and I wasn't reading it uh, to have a comment on this subject. I wasn't anywhere near. 
the end of Pilgrim's Progress, but I would love to dig through these old books that are online, and I came across a book by a pastor named Robert Shira. And this book is called The Deathbed Dialogue with Mr. Lister of Dundee, Scotland. And where I found that interesting, you got this older pastor who helps a younger pastor of 27 years old, who's actually laboring in the same city as a pastor that Robert Murray McChain labored in Scotland. And what's interesting about it is this Mr. Lister, this Pastor Lister, who had only been a pastor for four years, died at the age of 27 in the same city that Robert Murray McChain died at the age of 28. But Pastor Lister was not having an easy time on his deathbed. He was born in Dysart the 14th of February 1739 and was ordained to the Holy Ministry at Dundee the 17th of September 1762. He died at Dysart the 18th of January 1766, being then in the 27th year of his age and the 4th year of his ministry. Being informed that Pastor Lister was in the dark as to the state of his soul, I waited upon him, this is Pastor Shira, and inquired how it was with his inner man and what he had to say concerning the Lord's goodness. His reply was, nothing. I have nothing to say. I'm a poor, stupid one. I asked him if in some period of his life he had not met with deliverance from the Lord and found joy in his word. He answered, the stony ground hearers received the word with joy. And although he had met with deliverances, they were such as were common. So here he is dying and he supposes he's nothing but a hypocrite. Then he opened his mind more fully and told me that the Lord did begin a work in his soul about nine or ten years of age, that then his conscience was struck with the arrows of conviction for the sins of his former years, which made him tremble, and the remembrance of them still galled him. Indeed, he said, these convictions were a mean in the Lord's hands of keeping me from youthful follies at the college. But when he heard Christians talk of words coming with power for their relief, it did always sink his spirits as he had always so little to say that way. He didn't have the sense of his conversion. Robert Shearer answered, you know that self-examination is an ordinance appointed by God for bringing persons to clearness as to the quality of the work on them. And from what had passed, he might perceive the work of God in his heart to be saving. And so a spring of comfort, so far as it is evidenced union to Christ in whom all the seed of Israel shall be justified. But in regard to comfort as arising from Marx was very variable and fluctuating, it was his duty and interest to have his eye fixed on an absolute promise, such as that I am the Lord your God, Exodus 20, verse 2, or that I, even I, am he that blots out your transgression for mine own sake and will not remember your sins. That the blood of Jesus shed for the remission of sins is brought nigh in these, or the like words, was a never-failing and an overflowing source of consolation. So that's just the beginning of his counsel to him. And as this pastor raised more and more objections, this older pastor really was knowledgeable about the confession and the scriptures. And by the end of the book, this 27-year-old pastor had the highest assurance of his faith reality and was able to face his death so much more boldly. And I've narrated that, and that's on my site, puritanaudiobooks.net, under Robert Shira, S-H-I-R-R-A. But it is said of John Knox in the hour of his death that having seemed to have fallen into a slumber, interrupted with heavy moans and being asked why he sighed so deeply, he replied, I have during my life sustained many assaults of Satan, but at present he has assailed me most fearfully and put forth all his strength to make an end of me at once, end quote. James Rogers on his commentary on Pilgrim's Progress, God's people may long have thoughts about death, and they may have been long preparing for death, but after all, when they come to stand upon the brink of the river, when they feel the cold breeze from its waters blowing upon their souls, they will find it even more awfully solemn than they even thought of through life. 
How many reluctant feelings will now struggle in the heart? The solemn sensation of passing out of time into eternity. The pangs of dying. The forcible removal of the soul from her ancient habitation. The breaking up of the earthly habitation. The thought of entering the world of spirits and appearing before the judge of all. No wonder if thoughts of these things cause a soul to tremble upon the brink of dissolution. And what is very remarkable, these feelings are the most powerful and oppressive in the case of the most eminent Christians. He who holds in his hands the keys of hell and death is sometimes pleased to try them severely in the hour of dissolution. While on the other hand, weak believers are wonderfully surprised to find their fears all gone when they come to that point which they feared through life. But such is the prospect of death to the believing people of God, so awfully solemn does it appear when near at hand, that nothing can sustain the soul but a firm personal reliance upon the Lord Jesus Christ as dying for our sins and rising again for our justification, and now exalted to the right hand of God to communicate all necessary supplies of grace for the support of his people in life and in death. Fear not, he says to his servant John, I am the first and the last. I am he that lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen, and have the keys of hell and of death. Charles Overton, from his Cottage Lectures on Pilgrim's Progress, 1849. Soon we shall get a sight of the river. We shall hear the solemn murmur which it makes. We shall see it in all its awful reality stretched before us. And what a sight will that be? How shall we start and shrink? And how will the coward flesh recoil at the view? What a trial will this prove to our faith? What a test of our principles. No knowledge, however clear, of the gospel plan of salvation. No sensible comfort which we have formerly enjoyed nor even the actual possession of true grace in our hearts can certainly enable us to look on without dismay and still to advance with unhesitating step. Nature will shrink at the sight of death. Death as a penalty of sin is a most awful event. Why is it called in the Bible the king of terrors when we come to the brink of the river and find that there is no escape and when it is said to us individually, Thou art this day to go over. How many solemn and affecting thoughts will crowd upon the mind and how many reluctant feelings will struggle in the heart. The solemn sensation of passing out of time into eternity, the pangs of dying, the forcible removal of the soul from her ancient habitation, the only one in which she has ever dwelt, the breaking up of the earthly tabernacle. Oh, how can we realize all this without a feeling of the deepest awe taking hold upon us. The most experienced Christians sometimes may be a prey to this feeling even more than another. The degree of comfort or the sensation of awe with which a person looks death in the face is very far from being a sure indication of a spiritual state. Strong faith is sometimes strongly tried. Eminent Christians on particular occasions sometimes show that their usual graces are not in lively exercise. He who has the keys of death orders all the circumstances of it according to his own good pleasure. Sometimes in compassion to a feeble-minded but true disciple, the waters are remarkably low. And at other times when a long-tried disciple has to pass over, the body is so racked with pain, the mind so harassed with temptation, that the passage looks very formidable and the Jordan seems to have overflowed all its banks. Still, however, as a general rule to every individual, it may be said, you shall find it deeper or shallower as you believe in the king of the place. I didn't put the story here, the quote from, I thought about it a lot this week, uh, Henry Gouger's two years imprisonment in a Burman prison. Gouger 
was one who was hanging upside down in a prison in Burma where only his head and the back of his shoulders were on the ground and his feet were held up by ropes with a log going through it and at night they didn't sleep well and had too much time to think and gouger remarked as he knew that people were being taken out of prison and some of them put to death and that the king of Burma was arbitrary and a tyrant and he reflected to himself that all of the theology and everything that he had learned up till now was being tried and now more importantly than at any time in his life one thing mattered and that is am I in Christ is my faith in him because each night they didn't know what the next day was going to bring forth and thankfully God preserved Gouger and Judson had an arm Judson and Gouger was able to write that book but the way they wrote in the 19th century about the reflections of what was going on has always been an inspiration and remarkable to me but Alexander says and this is a just a few years after that happened. In 1844, some no doubt die under a cloud and go out of the world in distressing doubt respecting their eternal destiny. It is to guard against such an event that we would exhort all professors of religion and include ourselves in the number to begin in time to make preparation for death. Dear brethren, let us look well to the foundation of our hope. We cannot bestow too much pain and diligence in making our calling and election sure. We shall never regret on a deathbed that we were too much concerned to secure the salvation of our souls, or that we were too careful in making preparation for another world. Let us remember that our time on earth is short, and that whatever is done must be done quickly. There will be no opportunity of coming back to rectify what has been done amiss or to supply what is lacking in, quote, certainly a, a challenge to me. You know, it's so easy to be caught up in the cares of this life and the anxiety of just trying to have symmetry of Christian character in everything you do, your finances, your work, your relationships, and so on. And back then and before, uh, death was so commonly around them. I mean, if a pastor died at the age of 27 and 28, or I think about the case of John Owen, the Puritan who died in 1683. You can look through John Owen's life and you won't find any comments on it. It was reflected in a uh, biography of him by Andrew Thompson and William Orme that John Owen out of 11 children 10 of them died in infancy and the 11th died of tuberculosis at the age of 19. He had no surviving children and yet he doesn't even reflect on it in any of his writings which is simply remarkable. But they were so much more used to the fragility of life in those days compared to now. In Pilgrim's Progress it says, Then Hopeful said, Be courageous, my brother, I feel the bottom and it is firm. Christian cried out further, Ah, oh, my friend, the sorrows of death have totally encompassed me. I shall not see the land that flows with milk and honey. And with those words, a great darkness and horror fell upon Christian, so that he could not see before him. To a large degree, he lost his senses, so that he was unable to remember or talk intelligently about any of those sweet refreshments that he had experienced along the way of his pilgrimage. Rather, all the words he spoke revealed his present terror of mind and the fear that he would die in that river and never gain entrance into the celestial city. 
Those who stood by could see he was greatly troubled with thoughts of the sins he had committed. Both before and since he became a pilgrim, it was also clear that he was troubled with visions of demons and evil spirits. The words he spoke reflected this over and over. Well, I had already handed on this as we were going through Pilgrim's Progress that uh, this is consistent with Christian's character. He goes through the valley of the shadow of death and at the time, faithful was ahead of him and didn't have those agitations, those fears, that trembling that Christian had. And Christian spent a good deal of time in the slough of despond and Christian had to fight with Apollyon and so on and it Bunyan's just being consistent Christian I mean think about all of the things that God had already shown him the mercies and they had just gone through the land of Beulah and he had rescued them from the castle of giant despair and here he is at the river of death and none of these things seemed to make the that he had gone through in the past made its proper impression on him to give him faith for the present. William, I mean, Cheever says of William Cooper, Life, Genius, and Insanity of William Cooper, when Cooper wrote The Castaway, that was a, a long poem. Cooper was a prolific poem writer, you know, I had mentioned before that him and John Newton wrote the only hymnal, and one of the reasons they wrote that was to be remedial for Cooper because Cooper would write a poem and Newton would write a poem and Cooper would write a poem and that's how they could fellowship but Cooper got to the 60th, somewhere in the 60s number of hymns and never wrote another poem. He went into such despair and Newton finished the hymnal with over 200 hymns but well, what happened in the end with William Cooper who four times in his life had suffered such depression when Cooper wrote The Castaway he was in reality as to time just on the verge of heaven the day of his deliverance was drawing nigh. Nevertheless, up to the last hour, his mind remained in deep, unbroken gloom. In March, the physician in Norwich, being requested to see him, asked him how he felt. Feel, said Cooper, I feel unutterable un despair. The 19th of April, Mr. Johnson, apprehending that his death was near, adverted to the affliction both of body and mind which Cooper was enduring, and ventured to speak of his approaching dissolution as a signal of his deliverance. After a pause of a few moments, less interrupted by the objections of his desponding relative than he had dared to hope, he proceeded to an observation more consolatory still, namely that in the world to which he was hastening, a merciful Redeemer had prepared an expressible happiness for all his children, and therefore for him. To the first part of this sentence, Cooper listened with composure, but the concluding words were no sooner uttered than he his passionately expressed entreaties that his companion would desist. He said, please, please stop desist from any further observations of a similar kind, clearly proved that though it was on the eve of being invested with angelic light, the darkness of delusion still veiled his spirit. But he died as calmly as a sleeping infant in the afternoon of the 25th of April, 1800. And from that moment, the expression into which the countenance settled was observed by his loving relative to be that of calmness and composure, mingled as it were with holy surprise. And he regarded this as an index of the last thoughts and enjoyments of his soul in its gradual escape from the depth of that inscrutable despair in which it had been so long shrouded, in quote. What do you do with a story like that if your theology is that assurances of the essence of faith And doubting your salvation is a black mark against your testimony. I don't know how you could counsel someone like this. You would have to conclude 
William Cooper was not a Christian. And that's just depressing that someone could come to that conclusion. God does move in a mysterious way, as Cooper said. But he also knew there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins, and sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. And I believe we'll see William Cooper in heaven, there's no doubt in my mind. Back to Pilgrim's Progress. Therefore, Hopeful struggled in his attempts to keep his brother's head above water. Sometimes Christian would seem to have sunk down for good, but after a short time he would rise to the surface again as one half dead. Hopeful attempted to comfort him, saying, Brother, I see the gate and men standing nearby to welcome us. But Christian answered, It is you, it is you they are waiting for, for you have been hopeful ever since I first knew you. And so have you, Hopeful said. Ah, brother, Christian's face looked deeply troubled. Surely if I was right with the king, he would rise now to rescue me. But on account of my sins, he has brought me into this snare and abandoned me. Then Hopeful said, My brother, you have quite forgotten a text where it is said of the wicked, There is no pain in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. Psalm 73, verses 4 and 5. These troubles and distresses you are experiencing in these waters are no indication that God has abandoned you. Rather, they are sent to test you to see whether or not you will recall the evidences of his past goodness and rely upon him in your present distresses. Once again, quoting Cottage Lectures, Hard was the task of Hopeful to keep his brother's head above water. Sometimes he would sink and then come up again like one half dead. No effort was left untried by Hopeful to reanimate the drooping courage of his companion. Brother, he said, I see the gate and men standing by to receive us. But even this would not do. With the sad ingenuity of one who refuses to be comforted, and who can apply promises to anyone but to himself? Christian replied, It is you. It is you they wait for. You have been hopeful ever since I knew you. And so have you, rejoined hopeful to Christian. He well knew that in the hour of sore temptation, a person is very ill qualified to judge of his state and the way which he has taken. And make a comment on that because I mentioned this before when we were looking at the man in the iron cage and the interpreter was showing Christian this man trembling in this cage and the interpreter said to Christian when Christian said what does this mean what's going on here and the interpreter said ask him and that's one of the only parts of Pilgrim's Progress that I thought I don't know if I would have said that because as it says here, a person is very ill qualified to judge of his state in the way in which he is taken. When somebody is in that kind of despair and you ask him, the conclusion that he draws against himself is often erroneous. But Christian said, surely if I were right, he would now rise to help me. But for my sins, he has brought me into the snare and left me. The reply of hopeful is very judicious and is quite applicable to an upright soul harassed with doubt and temptation and deprived of sensible comfort at the prospect of death. Is it not said of the wicked, there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not troubled as other men, neither are they plagued like other men. The troubles and distresses that you go through in these waters are no sign that the king has forsaken you. They are sent to try you, whether you will call to mind that which heretofore you have received of his goodness, and live upon him in your distresses. distresses how forcible are right words. Then I saw in my dream that Christian was deep in thought a while. And Hopeful continued to speak to him, Be courageous, Jesus Christ makes you whole. With that, Christian broke out in a loud voice and said, Oh, I see him again. And he tells me, When you pass through the waters, I will be with you and through the rivers, and they shall not overflow you. 
Then the two pilgrims both took courage and the enemy became as still as a stone until they had crossed over. Christian discovered solid ground for his feet to stand upon and so it turned out that once he found his footing that the rest of the river was actually shallow and the two of them crossed over. It is an unspeakable mercy for the tempted Christian when struggling with the last enemy to enjoy the counsel and encouragement of a faithful and hopeful companion. Such a one will suggest that the case is not hopeless and that there is still firm ground upon which the poor soul may rest when most of all tossed with the tempest and not comforted. But how vain are all the efforts of mortal men to impact comfort to the mourner until the great teacher applies his own word to the heart. Nothing is more difficult than to restore peace and comfort to one who is writing bitter things against himself and who is mourning under the hiding of God's countenance. A great many causes may unite to fill even the upright with bitterness and distress at this solemn season. Staggering faith may plunge him in despondency. Bodily suffering may impair his memory. <coughs> mental, mental debility may cloud his experience. And above all, the enemy may use his malignant influence to harass and vex the soul of the Christian and to fill him with doubt and darkness in his last hour. Remind me when Christian went into the wicked gate and Satan's messengers were without shooting arrows. A Christian, as he was going in, here's his last opportunity before his salvation to vex him and cause him to despair of it. And then in the hour of death, the messengers of Satan buffet again. Now upon the bank of the river on the other side, Christian and Hopeful saw the two shining ones waiting to welcome them. Therefore, when the pilgrims came out of the river, the shining ones greeted them, saying, We are ministering spirits sent forth to serve those who shall be the heirs of salvation. Then they proceeded towards the gate. Alexander wrote, A young gentleman of fortune and liberal education had been for some months thinking seriously about his soul's salvation. But the work had not come to any maturity when by making too great an exertion of his bodily strength, he ruptured a large blood vessel in his lungs and was brought to death's door, not being able to speak above a low whisper. As he had been a student of mine, I was permitted to see him. When I inquired as to the state of his mind, he whispered in my ear that he was overwhelmed with the most awful darkness and terror. Not one ray of light dawned upon his miserable soul. I prayed with him and presented to him a few gospel invitations and promises and left him, never again expecting to see him alive. The next day when I called, the physician coming out of his room informed me that while they were waiting for his last breath, a favorable change seemed unexpectedly to have taken place, and he had revived a little. When I approached his bed, he looked joyfully in my face, pressed my hand, and said, All is well. I have found peace. This morning about the dawn, I had the most delightful view of Christ and of his ability and willingness to save me. And upon inquiry, I found that that was a moment when the favorable change took place in his symptoms. Faith and joy accomplished what no medicine could and acted as a reviving cordial to his dying body. He so far recovered as to live a number of years afterwards, though his lungs were never sound, and his consistent walk and piety attested the reality of his change. He soon joined himself to the communion of the church and died in her communion. Although we cannot now understand how the soul will act in the future world when divested of the body of clay, we cannot doubt that its consciousness of its identity will go with it. The memory of the past, instead of being obliterated, will in all probability be much more perfect than while the person lived upon earth. 
It is by no means incredible that memory in the future world will present to men everything which they have ever known and every transaction in which they have ever engaged. The susceptibility of joyful emotions will also accompany the soul into the visible world. And one of the first feelings of the departed saint will be a lively sense of complete deliverance from all evil, natural and moral. The pains of death will be the last pangs ever experienced. When these are over, the soul will enjoy the feelings of complete salvation from every distress. What a new and delightful sensation will it be to feel safe from every future danger, as well as safe from all past trouble. But the most important change experienced at this time will be the perfect purification of the soul from sin. The soul heretofore struggling with inbred corruption which damped its ardor, darkened its views and stupefied its feelings, now can act without any moral obstruction. So that's all I had for this Sunday school. I don't know if anybody wants to add anything or give us a comment. Next week, We'll discuss ignorance, and it's going to be a stark contrast to what we just read. And uh, I don't know how familiar you are with the writings of Bunyan besides Pilgrim's Progress. But I think it would be edifying to quote some of his other works uh, to familiarize yourself with them. And... um, One of them that uh, I know affected Dr. Joel Beakey when he first read it, and I heard him talking about it, so I wanted to read it, It was called The Barren Fig Tree. And uh, Bunyan's genius when death is standing at the bedside of somebody who has never borne fruit. But thanks be to God that we have mercy in Christ for ourselves and we must never forget what it says in Mark 4 blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear and that ends the Sunday school lesson on the river of death